Hello, welcome to another segment of Between the Lines. My name is Angela LaRosa, and today with me is our special guest, Dr. Melissa Miller. Miller is a political science professor at Bowling Green State University, and her research focuses on American politics with an emphasis on elections, voting behavior, and public opinion. For the issue on turnout, more than like 2 million people voted. Is that something that would be normal in like an amendment, kind of like a, an amendment vote? And were people like expecting such a large turnout or I guess not expecting such a large turnout because it was in August? So the interesting thing about the turnout in the August special election is that it was expected to actually be quite low. And in fact, I think that's why the proponents of issue one put it on the ballot during this sort of sleepy month of August when folks are really um, sort of on vacation or they're getting ready for back to school and they're not really paying close attention to politics. And I think one of the strategies of the proponents was to try to put it on the ballot at a time when turnout would likely be low. Well, we knew pretty early on that it wasn't going to be low in the sense that we could see record numbers of voters were turning out to vote early and to request absentee ballots. So if you compared those early turnout numbers, for instance, to just a regular, like, let's say, um, 2022 primary to nominate candidates for office, we saw that this turnout was you know, just as good, if not higher than that turnout. And so we clearly knew going into it that voters were actually not disengaged. They were paying attention and turnout was going to be high, but it was unexpected because another, another reason it was unexpected is we hadn't had an August primary um, for an issue like this for, I think it was about a hundred years. So early in the 20th century, when the Ohio initiative first became available for voters, that's the last time you could find sort of like a comparable election on the ballot. Well, you can't really compare turnout at that time. Like this is, that was way pre-internet, way prior to like modern campaigning. So for a whole bunch of reasons, um, it was, initially unclear and the expectation was that turnout would be low and then we had these indicators it was going to be the opposite of that and indeed it was when when you comp I don't want to say when you compare but so there there was this, um there's been a constitutional amendments in the past but have any of those ballots even like are comparable to what happened in August or last Tuesday so one of the reasons there really isn't a comparable ballot measure to look at is that this particular ballot measure was about the mechanics of holding elections. What the, should that threshold be for passing a constitutional amendment via statewide ballot? And that was, incidentally, one of the reasons that turnout was expected to be low, because it's like, are voters really going to get interested in the mechanics? I mean, it's kind of an arcane proposal or it might be perceived that way. But what happened is from the outset, opponents of the measure um, made clear to voters their view that the measure wasn't just a logistical matter about what th the threshold should be to pass a constitutional amendment, but that the measure was about abortion rights, that it was about reproductive rights. So throughout the summer, we saw the anti-issue one side really blanketing the state with advertising, direct mailers, texts, phone calls, and the like, saying this is an important measure. It's actually reproductive rights that are on the ballot when technically they weren't, okay? Technically it was about the threshold, but the anti side really connected it with a hot button cultural issue that folks do care about on both sides. Now, why were they so successful? And the victory was sizable, a 14 point win for the anti issue one side. Well, we now live in what we call the post-Dobbs era. After the Supreme Court handed down the Dobbs decision, which uh, overturned Roe versus Wade and um, overturned women's right to have an abortion, this is sort of a new era. 
And what we've seen in Ohio in August, as well as in other states since the Dobbs decision was handed down, is that whenever you put reproductive rights on the ballot, the side in favor of reproductive rights has come out on top. Now, issue one in Ohio was not a, it wasn't an up or down vote on reproductive rights. It was a ballot measure that had to do with the threshold. However, not only did the anti side link it to abortion all summer long in their advertising and their messaging, but in the last days, the pro issue one side, um, it became clear that they too saw it as an abortion measure. So they weren't sort of advertising it that way. However, in private meetings and in discussions with donors and so forth, it came out that the pro side as well thought that this is about abortion. This is about raising that level to make it harder to pass a reproductive rights measure that will be on the ballot in November. So once it became about this hot button cultural issue, turnout really went up interest really went up and voters were able to make the connection between issue one, which was just really about election mechanics and a hot button cultural issue. What what do you think is going to happen in November with the turnout that happened last Tuesday? I expect turnout in November to be even higher, in part because Ohioans, we're used to voting in November, right? That's what we do in that first sort of week in November. We vote on that Tuesday, right? So for one, voters won't be surprised that there's something to go to the polls for in November. Then you add to that a reproductive rights measure on the ballot, as well as a recreational marijuana issue on the ballot. And that's like two major issues that people really care about. Some in favor, some opposed, but passions are going to be high about both of these issues. And so that will drive turnout. In addition, I think both of these measures will get a lot of outside money pouring in to advertise on either side. So while we're in a little bit of a lull here in mid-August in terms of hearing about what's going to be on the ballot in November, sort of issue one, that's over, that advertising is now off the airwaves. After Labor Day, expect it to, you know, sort of very slowly start to go through the roof because it will. It will go through the roof. And um, in part, like I said, it's because people really care about these issues and passions run deep on both sides for both recreational marijuana and reproductive rights. But as well, both campaigns are going to know that so much of this will be about turnout. And so that's really going to drive up advertising budgets, drive up efforts at the grassroots to really get both sides really motivated to get out there and vote. So I expect turnout to actually be quite high in November. Looking at how astronomical issue one failed in Ohio, and a lot of it being because of the abortion rights, I guess, aspect or perspective put on it by both sides, do you think the reproductive rights amendment is going to get, is going to be the main draw of, I guess, November? And also, do you think like that's going to pass to be put into the Constitution? So I think there are reasons that the pro-reproductive right side, that pro-choice side, has reason to go into November with confidence, although I expect they're not going to take anything for granted. After all, the perception of Ohio is that we've really been trending Republican. We've been trending conservative. We've been becoming more of a red state than we used to be. Uh, and so the fact that issue one failed fairly spectacularly with that, you know, 14 point vote spread um, is a bit of a surprise to folks who thought, well, Ohio's a conservative state now. It's a red state. And yet what we've seen, even in red states that have a much longer history of being a red state, states like Kentucky and Kansas, those two states, as well as several blue or Democratic states, Every state that has put a reproductive rights issue on the ballot since the Supreme Court handed down the Dobbs decision overturning that federal right to abortion, we have seen that every reproductive rights measure has passed in the individual states, whether they're blue like California or they're red like Kentucky and Kansas. And so for that reason, um, 
again, I think the pro-choice side is likely to feel somewhat hopeful. We also have some polling data statewide from Ohio that suggests that about 57, 58% of Ohioans do favor reproductive rights. And so I think they have the math on their side in that regard. However, you know, what one poll tells you about statewide public opinion may not have a lot to do with who's actually turning out and voting. So like I said, I think the pro-choice side can go into November um, with some confidence. I doubt they'll want to take it for granted. And if you can then consider the pro-life side, yes, they lost on this technical measure. But I think in their view, the pro-life side is likely to say, look, that wasn't an up-down vote on reproductive rights. This will be much clearer to voters. We'll be able to really turn people out. Um, now, having said that, we know both from polling data in Ohio and nationally that a majority, and again, it's you know 57, 58% tend to favor abortion rights. So the math would seem to be on the pro-choice side rather than the pro-life side. But again, a lot has to do with motivation, mobilization, turnout. So I expect both sides to really fight hard for this. Were you so looking at Hancock County and in Wood, Hancock County was very neck and neck with people ultimately voting yes uh, marginally. Like it was so close. And a lot of people down here, because Hancock is so rural and so Republican, were very shocked at the numbers alone. Um, Wood County, it failed. Issue one failed in Wood County. Does that kind of surprise you just based on the demographics of the area? So one of the things that's really interesting look at the, looking at the county by county results is that if you look back at the 2020 presidential election, uh, Donald Trump won all but seven counties in Ohio, including Hancock County, including Wood County, okay? So Donald Trump won all but seven counties in 2020. Again, one of the reasons why pundits and analysts are tending to view uh, Ohio as a red state. But what happened when it came to issue one is that issue one uh, was defeated in not just the seven states that Joe Biden, seven counties that Joe Biden won, sort of like the big Lucas County, Cuyahoga County, the big urban counties. So Joe Biden won seven counties in 2020. Guess what? Issue one went down to defeat in 22 counties. So almost triple the number of counties. Now, why is that? What kinds of counties were sort of added that, that you know, that became, um, pro-Trump counties in 2020, but anti-issue one counties in 2023. Well, what counties did that? Counties like Wood County, okay? Counties like Medina County, kind of a suburban, um, ex-urban county near Cleveland. Counties like Delaware County, right? A suburban county right outside of Columbus. So what we call those collar counties, okay? Those collar counties around the suburbs of the big metropolitan areas, they tended to be anti-issue one. And so a way to think about it, whether it's a presidential election or whether it's a statewide issue election, is that we really expect that the more rural counties like Hancock counties, they will take the conservative position. They're going to give the majority of their votes to that Republican candidate, or they'll vote for the conservative side on a statewide ballot issue. And we know that the urban counties, places like Lucas and Cuyahoga County, they're going to vote for the Democrat or they're going to vote for that liberal side uh, on a statewide ballot issue. So who decides the winner? The winner? It does tend to be those suburban counties, counties like Wood County, Medina County, Delaware County. And when they sort of flipped, if you will. Now it's not exactly comparable, of course, there no, there weren't any candidates on the ballot, but they quote unquote flipped from voting for Trump in 2020 to voting anti-issue one. So many of them did, right? You know, that, that I think that's what's probably going to give pause and is giving pause to Republicans um, Republican leadership in the state about this November ballot issue, I think they're concerned. And and what I've read um, in terms of what conversations are going on at high levels within the Republican Party is they are concerned and, you know, wanting to um, try to figure out 
how to sort of win on this reproductive rights measure and defeat it in November. And believe me, issue one and that outcome got their attention. So they're not going to take anything for granted. And I don't think that the the pro-reproductive rights side will either. I think we're going to see a really hard fought campaign between Labor Day and November. But one of the last things I want to bring up and mention, proponents of issue one are kind of doubling back and saying that they will push issue one again uh, in the future. They said that they didn't have enough time, that the uh, anti-issue one, um, the people behind voting no on issue one outrageously like outspended them, even though I'm pretty sure Ballotpedia said it was like there was a million dollar margin between the two. Do do you see issue one passing in the future? Do you um after like the reproductive rights vote, do you see like issue one passing in the future or failing again in the future? There's certainly a history of failed ballot measures coming back and coming back and coming back until they pass. So we saw that, for instance, with the statewide measure to approve casino gambling. Um, I think that was three or four times that took and it went back on the ballot time and again. This um, this is interesting because to the extent that um, issue one really was about reproductive rights, it's too late to get issue one back on the ballot for November. So the state for decades has you know had laws about what it takes, what the deadline is to get an issue on the statewide ballot, and it's too late to sort of resurrect issue one for November. So they would have to wait until after the reproductive rights. Um, so a couple of things on that. If the reproductive rights measure fails, I don't know that there'd be as much energy to try to resurrect issue one and get it back on the ballot in 2024, perhaps. Um, but I think there are pros and cons and there are you know benefits and risks for the um, pro-life side, for the pro-issue one side to getting it back on the ballot. If August 2023 is any indication, um, attention would be really high, even if it went on the ballot in certainly 2024, um, certainly 2025. Voters are going to to not just remember, but the anti-issue one side will remind voters. So, right, voters don't vote in a vacuum. There'd be a big campaign. Um, so, given the fact that it was a fourteen point spread, I think right now the pro-issue one side is is you know they're testing out where do we go from here, right? And that's normal. That's totally normal. I don't anticipate a big push for an issue one coming back and, and and honestly in 2024 so it's too late for the 2023 ballot for 2024 it would be important for the pro issue one side to really consider this is going to be a presidential election turnout's going to be high no matter what so there would be a calculation that would have to be made if they're going to go to the effort to get it on the ballot um, to think in terms of, and, and, and by the way, you know, that's what politicians do, whether they're conservative or they're liberal, they place these issues on the ballot in, you know, high expected high turnout elections in those even years where we have federal elections on the ballot, or they'll decide to place it in an odd year election where turnout is expected to be lower. So I think all of those considerations would need to be mulled over very carefully. Um, I don't expect to see a huge surge right now um, on issue one. I think all the attention is going to go to that reproductive rights measure in November, see how that turns out, and then figure out what strategy is af afterward for the side that was disappointed in this August special election. Speaking of the 2024 election, Frank LaRose, our uh, Secretary of State, was a huge supporter of Issue 1, and now he's running for Senate. Do you think his failure with Issue 1 is going to play a part in his Senate campaign? So I don't think Frank LaRose is going to say much necessarily on the campaign trail about issue one, right? So candidates don't tend to focus on campaigns that they lost in the past when they're making an argument to nominate them 
or get them elected in a current election. However, I think the Sherrod Brown campaign is likely to make a lot of or at least try to capitalize on the defeat of issue one, to capitalize on Frank LaRose's support for it. So I think that issue one will continue to be on the radar because the Democrats and the Sherrod Brown campaign, Sherrod Brown, of course, being the Democratic incumbent UN senator, is likely to remind voters of Frank LaRose's support for this measure that turned out to be pretty unpopular if you look at the that vote outcome. So yes, issue one will be part of Ohio's US Senate campaign in 2024. All right, well, I wanna say thank you for your time. That's all the questions that I have and kind of all the topics that I wanted to hit point on. Um, again, thank you for talking You're welcome. with me. Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate it. <laughs> You're so welcome, Angela. 